Good morning. How are you guys today? It is beautiful. It was not raining when I got here this morning, but it has been raining since. Uh, my name is Tim Humphreys. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I so love being able to worship with you guys every single week. It truly is a joy. Uh, so last fall, we were approached by someone who wanted to give a large gift towards the vision of the church. And we talked about this last fall and a little bit this spring too. And we as a leadership knew that we didn't need to apply that to our needs in any way. And so we wanted to give it away. And so we were able to, we also provided the invite for others to be able to give alongside it. We were able to give away about $300,000 at the end of this last year as part of what we're calling a generosity initiative. And so what it is, is we chose three missions partners for us to be able to partner with in order to help catalyze some significant projects for them that they're working towards. The first one was Mid-India Christian Mission. We had them here last, well, I guess two months ago in May, and they're working in Central India with a lot of in incredible projects that they're doing. And the second one would be Chris and Aubrey Casey. They're working in and around Europe. And then finally, our third partner is TCM. TCM is a really, really cool ministry in that they work in a specific niche of providing master's level education and Christian spiritual formation, leadership development to Christian leaders in Central Asia and Eastern Europe and in Africa, in places that the church for many years wasn't able to work really strongly in. And they're able to sit in a really cool space and be able to resource and leverage the global church in order to drive forward the kingdom of God. And so we're, we were able to partner along with them and cover the cost of a lot of spiritual formation and leadership, leadership development training for approximately 100 leaders that they get to work with. And so we were, that happens because of your generosity. So I'm grateful for that. One of the things we wanted to do, though, is invite TCM to join us for a Sunday to be able to share not just what they're doing, but also what God has for us through his scripture. And so Tom Sears will be teaching through, continuing through as we walk um, Sermon on the Mount, that's what it's called. As we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, I'm a pastor, I know it. Um, I have to think about it for a second. But there's two things that I want you to know before we get started. One is that un we did not intend to plan it this way, but we are also sending a trip, a team to TCM. So their main campus is in uh, right outside Vienna, Austria. They have a seminary where they bring in students from all over those different places, the Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Africa. And that's where a lot of the education happens. It also happens in other training centers around the world. But we'll be sending a team there. And thankfully, Troy, our lead pastor, and our worship pastor, Thomas, will be able to go as part of that trip. So they leave next Sunday afternoon, so they'll be here for Sunday morning and then go. So just, I want you to know that so you can be praying for them and also so you won't be like, where's Troy? And why does, does he teach here anymore? He doesn't. So the, the second thing that I want you to know is afterwards, you, you'll get a chance to hear Tom teach, but then also we have an opportunity. We have, we're hosting a lunch after our third service in our student center, so right on the other side of this wall, where Tom's gonna be able to really just kind of open up, this is what the ministry is, and this is really, you'll hear some stories right now, but you'll really be able to hear and ask questions and just hear what the heart of God is through the ministry, and it's really incredible. It's one of my favorites. I've had the chance to visit uh, the campus in Austria, and it's just, it's a beautiful time, and my first experience with the global church and it, it, was, it was just really special for me. So would you join me in welcoming Tom to the stage? Tom is, Tom is a, a special person. He's a joy to know. He's a, a good friend. He has, uh, he's a couple years older than me, and it's been fun to, to learn. He's also taller than I am. Um, it's been a joy for me to know him, but also to watch his ministry grow as he's been at TCM. We've been working together through this partnership for a number of years, and it's been fun to see him move in that organization as well. I am excited for what you get to hear from what he has prepared and what God has provided for him. But I just wanna say a quick prayer as we get going. Jesus, we are so thankful for you and for how you are a God who's a provider and a God who who knows our needs and provides us what we need and helps shape our hearts so that way we can set down what we don't need and be able to hold on to what you have for us. I pray a blessing for this morning. Thank you for the rain and for just the, the gift that that is for us. Um, and thank you for these people and just the opportunity for us to worship together as a church with your whole church around the world and to know that we 
are getting to celebrate you together in that. I pray for Tom's words that as he teaches, it will be challenging not only for him, but for us as we are letting your spirit work in our hearts and shape us and form us to look more like you. God, I ask that you help us be humble and open-hearted and hear what you have for us. We're thankful for you, and we, we want nothing more than to look more like you. So do that in our hearts today. God, we love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you guys all for having me come out here and be able to share with you today. I know most of you didn't have a choice uh, that I was coming or not, but thank you uh, re regardless. Or thank you for not leaving right when you hear there's a guest speaker, because that's always a risk, uh, right? TCM's vision is that every nation will have effective leaders of disciple-making movements impacting their churches, cultures, and countries for Christ. Our ministry is just coming alongside of these national Christian leaders who already know the culture and speak the language and simply help them lean into God's calling on their life in the best and most effective way uh, as possible. So I'm not gonna be able to talk a lot about in the what and how we do things, and I hope you guys can join out for, for lunch after the third service. We, you can, can hear a little bit more about that. But at least to get a little bit of a flavor for what TCM is and how we operate, I do have a video of a story of a man who is a TCM graduate working in the country of Belarus. So check this video out before we begin the rest of our time. We started this church two years ago. And this is third church in our ministry, me and my wife, uh, we plant, uh, we're planting. And uh, we believe, and our church believes, that the best way to reach people for Christ is to plant churches. My name is Sergei, I'm from uh, Belarus, Minsk, and uh, I'm a pastor of New Covenant Church. I was born in a non-Christian family. My father was a Soviet Union officer, so I never heard the gospel, never heard anything about God. But um, my grandmother, she was a believer, and uh, when I came to her every summer, before I go to sleep, she read the New Testament as a fairy tale. And I shared with my father about these fairy tales, about Jesus, and he was, he's got mad. And then he, uh, he talked to my grandmother, and he has forbidden to read these fairy tales uh, with condition. Uh, so if you don't do this anymore, I'll bring him back again and again every vacation. If you keep doing this, I never bring him back. And she said, okay, I'm never going to do this anymore. Never, ever, I promise you. She, he said, okay, my father. And uh, she, I came again uh, for summer vacation. And uh, during the week, in one of the evenings, before I go to sleep, I found a book under my pillow. And that was New Testament. And uh, instead of reading the Bible, I started to read myself. And I fell in love in God. And then I find out that all the stories are true. So Belarus is about 10 million population, uh, and most of the people don't know God. On the surface, Belarus looks like a oh, developing country, but in reality, as I know many non-believers. I know I have friends who don't know God, and they are desperate. But at the same time, people faced with uh, problems like hatred, they hate one another, uh, they don't love one another, aggressiveness. In spite of that, Belarusian people, naturally kind people, easygoing people. And uh, when I talk to my friends, they don't see a way out of these problems, social problems, they don't know what to do. And uh, for me, it's a chance, it's an opportunity to declare that God has way. As far as for me, I believe Jesus did not invite us to plant church. He invited us to make disciples. And uh, it's a, at first glance, it's not a big difference, but actually it's a difference because as far as for me, I'm a pastor practicing disciple making. Uh, 
I read Bible with my friends. I talk about God with my friends. And I could feel from several subjects, I forgot the teachers from TCM, but who really encouraged me to do that. I was going to do this and I was doing that, but uh, they just improved my approach in practically saying, uh, in making disciples. And even I keep doing, using these methods. Uh, last Sunday we baptized five, five people, uh, four guys and one girl, and we used to read Bible with them on a regular basis. We bring the gospel and um, build up relationship. And so if this is how church planting works. TCM is a big part of this. Why we do this and why we do this way. So we are disciple-making church and we are thankful to God for disciple-making, for TCM who encourages us to make disciples with no exaggeration. I think that uh, Sergei is such a great example of the hundreds of graduates we have all over Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and in Africa, is because he, he talks on the point of, you know, it wasn't TCM that called me to ministry. It wasn't TCM that called me to do this. No, the Lord does this. The Lord convicted my heart. The Lord called me uh, to, to, to be this pastor. But TCM just helped me know how to be a disciple-making pastor. And Sergey lives out that replication. And uh, at the time of this video, it, it was his third church he planted. He's gone on and planted another church, so four churches, and even in very difficult circumstances uh, in Belarus. So he's just a good representation, I think, of a, a TCM graduate. This morning, we're talking about do not worry. You see the uh, free and unfettered. If you wanna turn to Matthew chapter six, uh, that would be wonderful, whether that's in your physical Bible or on your phone. Uh, we're going to be reading this section of Scripture, kind of halfway through Matthew chapter 6. As Tim mentioned, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. And what I think one of the things that's amazing about Jesus is he always anticipates the next thing that someone's thinking. You know, or the next thing that someone, the next question that someone's going to ask. And after Jesus spoke about this section on treasures in heaven, and I know your church has been preaching about this, uh, along with this generosity initiative, that we are called by Jesus not to store up treasures here on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven, where things do not, will, will last forever, um, where thieves can't break in and steal and moths don't destroy and so I'm sure Jesus is imagining, okay, what are the people going to be thinking when they hear this? They're thinking, okay, Jesus, if I'm putting all my resources in this way, and, and if I'm storing up treasures in heaven, well, what about, what about me? What am I going to eat? You know, what am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? How do I provide for myself and the things of this world? Because life is hard sometimes. Well, what do I do about that? And so perhaps without even someone physically asking that question, Jesus answers that. And so we're looking at Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. And I'm just going to read this section for us, and you all can uh, follow along. I'm reading from the NIV. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? <clears throat> and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What I'd like for us to do 
to start out as we consider this passage is I want you to think of the one biggest worry that you have in your life. And in fact, I'd really like you to write it down because we're gonna lo look at it again. If you have a pencil and paper, a journal, something, write that word down. If you don't, pull out your phone right now. Pop open your notes and write down this one thing. Try to get it to one word, okay? What's the, the biggest thing that keeps you up at night that you worry about? And I understand that this could be kind of awkward even writing it out um, because it's a big deal to you. Uh, this is not a, a small matter. If it's a person, maybe it's a person that is your biggest worry and you're constantly thinking of this person. Maybe they've gone off the deep end or, or, or whatever it is and you worry about this person. Write that person's name. I want every one of us to think of what is that biggest thing that we worry about the most and write it down. For me, when I think about and I ask myself the same question, uh, it's, it's, it's money. And I'm almost embarrassed to think about it when I look back at my life and how much God has provided in just amazing ways, I, I still worry about uh, money. I have seven kids and uh, working in ministry and my wife stays home with them and homeschools. And as you can just imagine, things are a little tight, you know, from, from month to month. And as the kids get older, they eat more and more too. I don't know if you've experienced this. Um, <laughs> But it, this is my struggle, and I, I don't say this, this lightly, and it's the one thing I constantly have to give over to God because I end up worrying about it, and then I'm good for a while, and then I, you know, the bills come in, and you, you, you log on to your bank account, and, and you see these things, and sometimes just things just don't line up on paper. Uh, and this summer has been probably my biggest uh, struggle to make a super long story short, I'm from Indiana, and the state of Indiana bought our house and a bunch of other property around there for big industry. And so we were kind of forced out of our house, um, and I have nothing to complain about because God provided this awesome other house. We're able to move in there. But for the summer, the timing worked out that I actually own both houses and will for three months. And so for three months, you have the double payments, the double insurance, the double, you know, all these things. And fortunately, we've completely moved out of one so we can at least, you know, turn the air off and stuff like that. But more than ever, it's just been a constant, like, worry. Um, and so a few weeks ago, I know I'm coming out to Council Bluffs, and he said, sure, I, you know, I can preach, you know, what you guys are talking about. And I get this text from Tim, says, hey, we want you to preach on this passage about do not worry. <laughs> like, Okay. And I laugh about it now, but it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> and I began worrying about this sermon. And, uh, you know, to, 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 to summarize, what I want to say is that before, you know, weeks before even we're here right now today talking about this, I really, really needed uh, this verse. I really, really needed uh, Jesus in talking in this, in this Sermon on the Mount about do not worry, but seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, and it has been a hard few weeks, but has been so, so good. And of course, a total God thing that he says, Tom, I know you need it. <laughs> you need it probably more than everybody else at Council Bluffs. So you're gonna, you're gonna preach on it. Uh, you looking at your word, it might not be money, but I know it's something that also is a really big deal to you. Or it's somebody who means a lot to you. As we look at this passage, there's a few things I think that Jesus is not saying that I want to be super clear about. First of all, I don't think he's specifically talking about people who might have serious clinical mental health issues. These are a super, super serious things. And in addition to engaging Jesus in this sermon, they might need to get serious uh, help for those things. I also don't think this is talking about this surface level anxiety that sometimes we get. Uh, for me, sometimes I get it when I eat too much sugar or drink too much caffeine, you know, and you just get kind of jittery. Uh, or it's a real thing where you are stimulated so much by, you know, your phone and your work and your job and just all of these things that can be right in front of our face in this life that your blood pressure even like raises and you have this level of anxiousness and it really takes just kind of backing away and getting rid of some of these stimuli um, to kind of re, you know, get good again. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. What I do think this passage is really trying to teach us 
is about our posture towards the things in our life out of our control and our priority for the things that are in our control. Okay, so we're talking about posture and priority. Our posture towards the things outside of our control and our priority for the things within it. So the first thing, talking about posture, just look back at verse 26 there. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? It's often said that if you wanna know the real value of something, or the real value of something is only determined by the amount that somebody else is willing to pay for it, right? You may think that your hot rod car is worth $2 million. Uh, but unless somebody's willing to pay $2 million for it, it's hard for you to say that it's actually really worth you know, that, much, uh, that much money. And sometimes our worry, and we can get so down and depressed, and I think Satan uses this, is we begin to lower the value of ourselves. I'm really not that great. I'm really not worth that much. If, peop, if I wasn't around, people probably wouldn't even notice you know, that much. But we know that you, every single one of you, is so incredibly valuable. Why? Because of the price that God paid for you. Think about the most valuable thing in the world. You wanna ask if you have a kid, would you sell or, or, or have your kid die for that most valuable thing? Probably not. But God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you. He shows and demonstrates his love for you and your value because Christ died for you. That's the ultimate price. And so the first way we need to posture ourselves is as the children of God bought with the highest price of a God who loves you so very much. The next way we need to posture ourselves, that's how we view ourselves as children of God, but how do we view God? I was listening to the sermon online um, that Troy preached last week, and he talked about the, the Sabbath, you know, and that in fasting, they, in church tradition, they wouldn't fast on Saturday or Sunday. Why? Because Saturday, the Sabbath was to look back at creation and celebrate that, and then Sunday was to look forward to the resurrection uh, and celebrate that, so you don't fast on those days. And in thinking about Sabbath, I think it really connects with this sermon right here. Uh, when we look back at creation and we see that God created the heavens and the earth and the plants and the animals and the people, all of that in day one through six, and then it says on the seventh day, he rested. And so we are commanded you know, to do the same. And I don't know if you've ever asked this question. In my, I have, and one of my kids asked me recently, and my wife knew I was about to get on a soapbox and, and, and give my answer to this. Uh, he says, Dad, if God is so powerful, why does he need to rest? Right? I mean, have you, have you thought that? I think it's a legitimate question. If God breathed the whole universe together, which I would be tired if I you know, created something like that, uh, why would he need to rest? And when we look at this word rest and how it's used in the Old Testament, when the word is used when referring to a king, multiple times in the Old Testament, you will see that it shows that a king rests on the throne. And there's one verse that I think is really powerful I wanna bring to your attention. It's Psalm 132, verse 14. It's a great example of it. It says, this is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have deserved it. You see, God doesn't rest in a bed. The king of the universe who created everything doesn't rest on a couch. There's only one place for the almighty God, an all-powerful God to rest, and that is on a throne. And when he did that on day seven, he didn't just say, I'm in charge, but he says, everything I made through day one and six, now I give meaning and purpose and value because I am here as king over it all. I don't know what you guys do Monday through Saturday, 
But I know I can tell you that if you don't have God on the throne in your life, that whether it's now or one day in the future, you'll find out that everything you do, ultimately, no matter how great a work it is, ultimately, it's going to be lacking in meaning and void of real purpose unless God is on the throne. And I really believe that that is what Sabbath is all about. It's about taking a step back and evaluating your life and saying, God, where have I taken you off the throne? And how can I reorganize myself and my life, my priorities and my thoughts and my activities so that you are back on the throne again? Look back at your word that you wrote down. I'm sure for some of us, there's probably quite a few things that you could have written down, but I wanted you to write down the biggest worry, the biggest thing, the hardest thing for you not to worry about, because I think it's easy to trust God in the little things, (laughs) but I really believe that the things we worry about the most probably tells us where we trust God with the least. And our posture the only way is to get our posture in a place where in that item, that person, we say, ask ourselves the question, God, are you truly on the throne in this part of my life? Now, after thinking of posture, we think of priority. And I think part of the reason why I struggle uh, so much with worrying about money is because it seems like some of the stuff is in my control. Now, I know things can change like in a second, and all of a sudden you have this stark realization that everything is out of your control. But I could potentially get a different job, you know, that made more money. I could potentially, you know, not spend on this and spend on this instead, or these little decisions that, that are part of, you know, your, your money. And so that's why I feel like it's part of the struggle. It's hard for me to release it. And I'm just naturally the one that pays the bills and does, does that stuff because it feels like I am a little bit in control. But I love how this passage, just like in much of the Bible, God just doesn't, it doesn't just give you something not to do. It's not just a list of rules, but he gives you something to do in its place. And in fact, I think the Bible gets a lot of bad reputation for just being a big list of rules. Maybe you've thought this before, maybe you still do kind of feel like this, and you get lost in the Old Testament a little bit, and it's easy to see, like, man, this feels like just a bunch of, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But what's crazy and separates Christianity from all other religions is that before any rules are ever made, God moved first, and God loved first. My favorite verse in the Old Testament is Exodus 20, verse 2. Now, in Exodus 20, this is where you find uh, the the Ten Commandments. And a lot of you are probably very familiar with that, right? The commandments that God gave for his people to follow. And there was a lot of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Right before he gave the Ten Commandments, in Exodus Exodus 20, verse 2, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, before he ever even gave them and let them know how to live, and what rules to follow. God came down and saved them. Not because of something that they did, but because he loved them and he saved them. He said, before I give you this, I want you to know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. Therefore, and I have a better way for you to live now. And I really think all throughout the Bible, and this is what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount uh, too, is God had saved you, God loves you. Now just, I have a better way for you to live. What is the thing that he tells us to do? After he says, don't worry, don't worry, don't do this, don't do this, don't worry about this. He says, but first, seek first his kingdom and God's righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is what really changed my life in this worry of finances where even some things that do kind of feel in control and some decisions that I have to make, I know that first, before I even think about that decision, I need to be asking the question, how am I seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness? 
And then what does he say? All of those other things will fall in line. And if you really live this out, I dare you to give it a try. If you really live this out, you'll realize that some miraculous way, those other parts of your life will fall into place. And time and time again, when my wife and I are generous and we do things and we push our finances aside for a second to say, how can we love others and how can we be generous? He always provides for what we need. When we look at the priority, we think of how we organize our life. Look at your to-do list. Say, how can I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Your church lives this out. Through this generosity initiative, it's clear that the church as a whole and you as individuals are seeking first his kingdom and giving. And when you say, you know what, we could store away in barns, we could you know, save money for a new building campaign in the future or all this stuff, but we wanna seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, so we're gonna give this money away to build the kingdom right now. And I just wanna say thank you so much from everyone at TCM who is being a part of a, a recipient of that and for us to use that in the kingdom work that we do. Did you know last year was actually one of the worst years for nonprofits? A giving wise. So it, the, the amount of, um, I forget the statistics, but I read this article for nationwide statistics for giving. It was somewhere like 6% decrease from individuals and a little bit more just across the board. Uh, and that steep amount of decline is only similar to other points in history of serious financial recession. So it's similar to like the uh, decrease in giving in 2008 when we had the huge financial crisis. Last year was the worst year for nonprofits in that way in a long time, except for one category. In the one category, the only category of nonprofits that didn't decrease at all was to religious giving, to religious organizations, churches, and other nonprofits like TCM. It actually increased by 5% this uh, last year, 2021 over 2022. And that's just a testimony of saying, when we live this different way, where even though the economy might be shaky, even though some things might be a little uncertain, we're gonna seek first the kingdom of God and continue giving to our church and continue doing these things, knowing that God will provide for us in perhaps ways we can't even expect. So thank you for being a part of that statistic. As we close, I want to share a, one more story of another TCM graduate. Uh, this graduate is from Ukraine. I'm gonna try to avoid using his name um, because this is, I know this, this service is streamed online. But this individual uh, was a bad kid growing up. He got into uh, violence and crime in the gang life at a young age, and by the age of 16, found himself in prison because of the things that he was involved with. And at his deepest and lowest point uh, in prison, he saw the, the Jesus film. And he said, when it came to the part of the thief on the cross next to Jesus, he said, I knew that that thief was me. And I need Jesus just like he did. And turning his life around, he got out of prison and totally set his heart and mind on building the kingdom of God, actually through another TCM um, graduate, joined his church, launched into ministry, became a TCM student himself, started planting churches. And one of his, uh, uh, one of the aspects of his ministry in 2014, he was a chaplain in the Ukrainian army, the first time the Russians came in to Eastern Ukraine. And we, in contact with this man, heard story after story of just crazy things where he'd be ministering to the, the soldiers there, bringing Bibles and even sometimes food and with the, the under, uh, undersupplied uh, soldiers there. Or the next day, he found out that same building he was in was bombed um, and just narrowly escaping death time and time again. And so I, uh, and, and he's still in southern Ukraine right now and ministering in different ways. And I reached out to him. This was um, on Monday, so about six days ago. And I said, in the light of this situation of, of you in Ukraine and what's going on there, Matthew 6, this part of do not worry, what, what does that mean to you? And so graciously, he sent back a few voice messages actually, um, 
because that was the most convenient for him to, to do that. And so I transcribed some of what he said and paraphrased it here, and I just want to read his response um, to that question. He said, Brother Tom, thank you so much for the question about this passage. In my view, this passage addresses our desire to control and leads us all to beg the question, who is ultimately in control, us or God? Our natural tendency is to try to keep things under control with our own power. And when situations outside of our control go wrong, this naturally brings fear. Let me tell you a story about what happened to me yesterday. Yesterday was Sunday, and I went to preach at a village that's a half a mile away from the front line of battle with the Russians. Every time I go to this village, I tell my wife and children goodbye because I know there's a chance I may not come back. Right at the point I was preaching on being grateful, bombing began all along the civilian street where the house of prayer was. One of the bombs hit directly to the house right next to us, destroying it completely. In the house where the church was meeting, plaster on the ceiling of the building began to break and some fell to the ground. You see, Tom, in that moment, you realize there's absolutely nothing you can do. You feel so hopeless. When the bomb started, I first got really worried when I noticed the dogs. In Ukraine, we have many dogs that are trained to guard the houses, and these dogs never come inside under any circumstances. But when the first bomb came down on that street, all the dogs came rushing in the house in fear and almost knocked me over. I've had several cases of this type of danger during this war, and each time was very different. Each time was scary. And I always have the thought, like, that could have been me. And when that thought comes, I would instantly lose peace and begin to worry. But yesterday, I didn't bother myself with that thought. Instead, I made the decision to realize that I cannot control the direction or the timing of the bombs, but God is in control. And when you view the world where everything is in God's control, the chaos just goes away. On this day, even when the terrible noise of the bombs and the shaking of the building, uh, my heart was not panicked. And that's what brings you out of despair. The 30 people who are at the church meeting, their faces, uh, they face situations like that on a daily basis. They know God is in control, and they too have many stories of how God miraculously works in their life and circumstances. Even with many people leaving the cities for safer places, the churches are filled with Christians and seekers all over the south of Ukraine. That's the answer. If you worry, what can you change? If you have the opportunity to hide in a cellar and get safe, that's great. But we're not in despair because we know God is in control. We must trust him. This is how I wage war in this spiritual reality personally by focusing my mind on God who sits on the throne. Nothing is kept from his attention. By considering this, it gives me peace, it gives me victory, and encourages me to continue going to these churches and ministering to them. Thank you everyone to TCM for sending this question, for remembering us, and for praying for us. It's a wonderful example of how we posture our lives and how we prioritize what we do by seeking first the kingdom, even in the midst of danger. And when we come to a time of communion every week, we see and we experience how by saying yes to worrying is also saying no to the freedom we have by giving that burden to God who is ultimately in control. Driving home from work one day from the TCM office on the interstate, um, on the, uh, there's a billboard at my exit, and it's an electronic billboard, so it switches every once in a while, but one of the messages on it was just a blue background in white words that said, you are enough. And that really made me pause and think. <laughs> and my thoughts went something like this, I'm like, wow, that is such a nice and encouraging thing to say that is so completely and utterly not true. <laughs> and 20 minutes ago, by the way, I didn't hear you sing any songs that were similar to that. No, what you sang was hallelujah 
we are not alone. God really loves us. His mercy is enough. As a dad, one of the biggest things I want my kids to know growing up is that they are not enough and they never will be. But there is one who is enough. And God loves them so, so very much that he sent somebody who is enough so that they never have to be. In this time of communion, I want you all to look at that word that you wrote down one more time. And as you consider this and we take communion together, I'm gonna leave a little bit of time of silence. And I want you to envision laying that word or laying that person at the foot of the cross. So will you pray with me? Father, Lord, you are so good in giving us even this message. These worries that we have are real and we know that you know them. You know the worries better than we even do and you love us more than we can even imagine. Father, as we lay these at the foot of the cross, we acknowledge that only you are enough and we are just one catastrophe away from really experiencing that we are completely out of control. So we give this to you in your control. And over the next 30, 60 seconds, just want to silently reflect on this and give this to you, Father. Let's take the bread together as a church, remembering Jesus' broken body for us. And let's now take the juice together, remembering Jesus' sacrifice. Death that we will all experience teaches us that we're not enough. (laughs) But the cross reminds us that Jesus is. And that message right there is really good news. (laughs) Thank you, church, for allowing me to come and spend this time with you. Thank you so much for your continued prayers and support of this ministry and the many other missions that you are all involved with. Um, and I, I hope I can see a lot of you at the, at the lunch after third service as well. So thank you.